Morning everybody. In today's lecture we're going to cover very briefly an overall history of wildlife management and how this has worked over the over time around the world. We're also going to touch on uh, several wildlife management tools and then what I'm going to spend the bulk of the lecture doing is I'm going to talk about the seven broad types of wildlife management programs that are typically employed in various conservation scenarios. So to kick things off, let's talk about the history of wildlife management on a global scale, really. And it's important to note from the outset that wildlife ownership has changed over time. In the early days, um, for example, with the Great Khan in Asia, all wildlife belonged to that nobleman. In Europe, the system has been that each landowner then owns his land and the wildlife that exists on that land. By contrast, the American system is one where wildlife belongs to all people and is held in trust by the state for future generations. Now, interestingly, in South Africa, we have a bit of a mixture of both the European and American systems because if a wildlife owner actually fences his land, his or her land, and obtains what is known as a certificate of adequate enclosure, then that person then owns the wildlife on that land. However, if the landowner cannot get a certificate of adequate enclosure, then the wildlife is owned in a similar way to the American system where it's held in trust by the state for future generations. Now, when it comes to the tools that are available for the wildlife manager, we must remember that, that management programs, because of the nature of the animals and the environments that we are working in as conservationists, these programs need to be flexible um, because the wildlife populations themselves and their habitats will change from year to year and will be subject to abiotic factors and events such as droughts, heavy rainfall, and so on. So wildlife managers need to be able to collect information on not only the habitat, but also the wildlife during the year to decide how they're going to manage their wildlife population. So it's about, it's a two-step process about collecting information and then using that information to inform how best to manage the habitat and the wildlife. So now what we're going to do is we're going to have a look very briefly at seven main or broad wildlife management programs that are typically put in place in wildlife areas or conservation areas uh, in many parts of the world and allow wildlife managers the tools to effectively manage their wildlife and habitat populations. So the first of these wildlife management or management program that pertains to wildlife has to do with the legal system. So all countries around the world have environmental laws. And last year in environmental law, you would have heard about some of the legislation that is involved in the protection of the environment and wildlife in South Africa. And so laws are very important for providing protection to wildlife species. Um, but often this approach is quite, quite difficult because it can lead to it being rather inflexible. So it's not it's not easy to change laws if suddenly there's a massive drought and your large population of springboks starts to die off. You will then struggle to get permits and so on because the laws don't allow a flexible approach, which is what um, wildlife management requires. So protection laws for wildlife species, they do need to be flexible and they need to be based on biological information that can be used to make their management uh, effective in the long run. And this flexibility is needed to correspond to changes in habitat, changes in wildlife populations as time goes on from year to year. Now, a second 
relatively or quite controversial management program is that of predator control. And this is actually used around the world extensively in order to manage wildlife and conservation areas. So we must just remember from the beginning that a predator is an animal that lives by killing other animals for food. Okay. So previously, predators have been considered very bad animals for wildlife managers and many areas around the world, including South Africa, actually had governments that offered bounties or money, monetary rewards for controlling or, if you want to put it more bluntly, killing predators. And what, what it was thought was that when you control the predators, so if you decrease the number of predators, you would actually encourage the number of other wildlife species. Okay, But this is just one way to control wildlife because when habitat is good, there is a healthy balance between predators and prey. And so it might not actually be necessary to control predators. What in fact might be more important is to protect small or unhealthy wildlife populations from predators. So basically what I'm saying here is that it might not be the first thing that you go and do as a wildlife manager is to control the predators, but in a very small area, we have a very small population of a very important species, then perhaps predator control could be considered. But this is something that is ethically quite a big issue in South Africa and elsewhere, and so shouldn't be the first step in your management program of a conservation area. Now the third broad category of management programs is the creation of refuges or what we would call in South Africa as reserves. Now these reserves or preserves as they're called in the United States, they provide wildlife with a little safe space so that their numbers can, can increase. And in general, there are four types of refuges. Right, so the four types of refuges are big game refuges. So this is where a, a lot of the South African um, game reserves would fall into this category, where the overall aim is to protect a breeding stock of these populations so that their numbers can increase. In other parts of the world, slightly, some of them can be found in South Africa, as we have small game protection areas where these are, these are really small areas, um, nature reserves, provincial nature reserves are often examples of these. Um, these are small areas that protect small game species, often birds, um, sometimes insects, and so on. Uh, we have relatively few of them in South Africa, but they can be quite important. And the third type is a non-game area, and this area is established to protect the habitat. So it's more of a what we would call a botanical reserve. So those, those can be quite important. Now, when it comes to, to reserves, we need to remember that they, a large increase in the population of wildlife can actually deplete the food supply. That is available and this can damage habitats okay so they are only really effective when they used so using reserves especially in South Africa where we fence our reserves fairly commonly and um, they're really only effective when they used with other management goals that, that and other management tools so remember that the goal of a reserve is to preserve the wildlife habitat and keep the wildlife in good condition Fourth, the fourth broad management program is that of restocking. And here we've seen quite a bit of this in South Africa over the last 10 or 20 years, where the overall goal is to release wildlife into areas that have very few or no population. So you're restocking it with wildlife species. So what it involves, it involves releasing artificially reared animals in some cases, and there's some examples of these on Moodle for you to have a look at, back into a wild situation and allowing them to establish. Okay, In South Africa, it's actually not often artificially reared animals. In fact, it's often 
already wild animals that are restocked from other game reserves. Now there are several limitations of a, of a restocking approach uh, and that is you need to remember that the habitat must be considered. If you introduce wildlife uh, beyond its carrying capacity, the animals will eventually die. And it's, it's particularly important for our big species. So species like elephant, species like rhinos and buffaloes that have very large area and food requirements. So it's very important not to destroy your habitat when you are considering restocking. So now this is not always necessary if you have um, habitat that is in good condition. But we may want to use it in cases where we have endangered species and restocking them in other areas might be a good way to protect or maintain that species going forward. Now the fifth broad category of wildlife management is the introduction of exotic wildlife. Now this can be considered a form of stocking and the overall purpose is, is actually to introduce exotic species um, that have similar habitat where they come from and you're introducing them so that they're not damaging the local habitat. But this is not always and it's actually not generally successful um, and it in fact can cause more problems than what it is is. Uh, is worth. So as, as an example though, there were ring-necked pheasants that were not indigenous to Hong Kong, but they were, oh, sorry, not indigenous to the United States, but they were introduced from Hong Kong and they've become quite an effective game bird species in the United States and they haven't displaced local species. The chuka partridge um, is another exotic bird species that has been established in many semi-arid e uh, regions of the United States. Um, and this is, this is something that is very important in the United States because it's used as a game bird species for hunting. So it hasn't actually displaced the local species. But the muskrat and European starlings are some examples of unsuccessful exotic species introductions. In fact, in South Africa, we have uh, European starlings that are starting to take over many urban areas because of their purposeful introduction and they are displacing local species okay so importantly most introduced exotics find their habitats their new habitats unsuitable and often disappear after release but this is not always the case and in fact sometimes their numbers like European starlings and in fact Indian miners or the common miner start to flourish and start to displace local bird species, which is not ideal. The sixth category of a management program is that of habitat management. And as we've said a couple of times, habitat is the absolute key to the survival of habitat. Without suitable habitat, the wildlife cannot survive. So if there are two points from the slide that you remember, they should be these two points. So the wildlife cannot survive without habitat. And wildlife habitat is decreasing at an extremely fast rate around the world as the human population increases. So the main purpose for managing habitat is to prevent the wildlife that is already there from being destroyed or lost even further. And the most important thing that you can do as a wildlife manager or a conservationist is to help wild to help wildlife is to prevent the loss of habitat. So habitat management, ladies and gentlemen, is absolutely key. And we're going to unpack this a little bit more in the next section. The final, the seventh and final management program that I want to talk about is that of hunting and trapping. And this can be linked to the predator control, but this is more broadly, this is for wildlife more broadly. And, and this is often used around the world, including South Africa, for, the, for managing wildlife populations below what would be considered the carrying capacity. So with careful regulation, excess animals can be removed and there can be a profit made in South Africa, certainly, from these animals. So hunting and trapping or the removal of animals is used as a management tool 
to, to remove excess animals, so animals that are above the carrying capacity, when you don't deplete the breeding stock. So you, the breeding stock continues to breed and you're able to make money from the removal of these animals. In addition, you can use sport hunting or sport trapping to provide important um, funds uh, for the management programs and you are able to pump them back into your conservation area. And in some parts of the world, wildlife management programs are actually funded almost entirely by hunters and sportsmen. And certainly there is a move in South Africa for this adding tremendous value to the management and conservation of wildlife. Let's wrap up this series of the section of the lectures before we move on. And let's just use these next two slides to summarize what we have covered so far in REM 202. First of all, remember that wildlife management is actually a science, and it's a science of managing wildlife and habitat, including people, for the benefit of everything. Conservation is known as wise use, or sustainable use if you want, and preservation is non-use. Thirdly, the habitat is the key to all wildlife survival. Without habitat, wildlife, animals will not survive. Carrying capacity is the number of animals that the habitat can support throughout the year without any damage to the animals or the habitat. And that's an important section, that second part without any damage to the animals or the habitat. Fifthly, if wildlife numbers, if animal numbers exceed carrying capacity, the excess number, the excess animals will die. Okay? And the birth and death rates of most species are high. So remember this, I'm, and this is linked to five, and we're gonna we're gonna get there in a moment. And it's very important to remember that, the, that although wildlife can breed very quickly, they can also die off quite quickly. But sometimes it's important to manage before there are massive die-offs or potentially massive births. So remember that if you have inflexible laws, they will prevent wildlife management from being effective. So you need to make sure if you're a lawmaker that you make the laws flexible. And then finally, Wildlife biologists, such as yourselves, need to have a broad knowledge and a huge range of skills to manage wildlife effectively. And it's very important that all of this has the support of the public.